911, what's the location of your emergency? Yeah, uh, I live at 885 Yale Farm Road. Okay. I think I need an ambulance. Okay, what's going on? The truck fell on my stepson. The truck fell on your stepson? Yes, and we just got home, and I don't think he's alive. You don't think he's alive? No, 885. Okay. Okay, he's pinned, under, he's pinned underneath the uh, truck? Yeah, my husband's lifting up the truck. Honestly, I don't think he's alive. Okay, how old is your son? He's 22. And did the your husband get the truck off of him? He was stacking it up when I was just out there. Okay, are you with your, your son right now? <laughs> he's not alive. Is he, is he breathing? No. He is not breathing. Okay. No. Okay, we're going to start CPR, okay? Yeah, Carl, they want to start CPR. Do you know CPR? His chest is crushed. His chest is crushed? Is no. He, he's probably been under here for hours. Oh my god. Alright, what oh is your god. what is your ma'am, what is your first name? Cindy. Cindy? C I N D Y. Okay, and your last name is Carlson? Carlson? Oh my god. <laughs> the 911 call you just heard was placed after Levi Carlson's stepmother discovered his lifeless body in the barn. He'd been performing repairs under his dad's old truck when it suddenly collapsed, effectively crushing every last remnant of life right out of him. Four years later, in the interrogation room, years of unbelievable secrets would be revealed, exposing a story so shocking, you'll have to see it to believe it this question because he's implying that Carl took an insurance policy out on Chris right before her death, which is similar to what happened with Levi. Carl knows the closer in time to Chris's death, the more suspicious it appears, so he will claim it was further out than it was. What's your, your deceased wife's name? Chris. Chris. So about how long before, do you think? It's, it's... Was it like in other people's minds, like relatively soon? It's got to be, I don't know, it's got to be, it's got to be like three, four months or something. Oh, okay, yeah. so it was a significant, well, actually, that's not a long time. In actuality, the application was signed and the premium was collected on December 12th of 1990, just a mere three weeks before Cindy died in the fire. So she was like three or four months, she's, she's insured through your job and then she, the fire occurs? Right. Okay. I mean, and, and it's, it's striking. Believe me, you. If if anybody were you were you thinking like I can't believe my this is how does this no, happen? No, I'm like if and my family. I I you know how some people go through life and no matter what happens, everything that can go wrong can go wrong. It's Murphy's law. You must be. Irish. I was in Murphy's California. Well, yeah, that must have been Murphy's law. And it's like you've got to be freaking kidding me. You have got to be... So did you go through the ringer because of that being a suspicious circumstance? Well, or? just, no. It was the fact that she died at home and they got to go through the whole gauntlet. Who's that? The, the fire department. I never got invested by anybody else. Oh, so where's the gauntlet? Just them. I mean... The they, fire department yeah. pushed through the gauntlet? We can, well, they, they're they the fire investigators. So whatever. it wasn't a criminal investigation? No, 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 no. no. So and, there was um, no well, gauntlet. I just want to... No, it just... It just I guess when you're when you lose a spouse and you got three little kids and all of a sudden you lost every the, the it sounds bad the shoes and clothes that I wore mm. and the underwear I wore were mine. Mm. Instead of saying anything about how it affected him to lose his wife and his kids to lose their mother, he's focused on himself and how he had to wear borrowed clothes. People get after I, the fire? Yeah, I lost everything. Mm -hmm. I lost vehicles. I lost every possession I owned. Well, and her family was right there, right? Did they help you out? Yeah, they, I mean, they, but I'm wearing borrowed clothes. Yeah, no, that sucks. I mean, I had a guy that I knew a little bit. Mm -hmm. He took me down, bought me. You lost all books. your possessions. Right? Everything. He mentions losing all of his possessions, but doesn't express anything to suggest that his wife was the most significant loss. Most people wouldn't be concerned with losing their things in a fire when their spouse has died in the same fire. I'm burnt. You know, I got burns all over my face. My brain. Do you have any pictures from the burns? Did you keep them like that? I don't. If I do, and they, I, I don't know where. Did you have to go to the hospital to check out. Oh, they, yeah, they took me right to the hospital with animals. I mean, I, eyes were burnt shut. He also talks about how he got burned, but doesn't mention any injuries his children may have had. Um, it's traumatic. It must be. You, we had a fire, but we got out. You know what it felt like? It felt like somebody hit me in the face. 
the five baseball bats at the same time. You mean the fire? I'm yeah. talking about the loss of your wife. Oh, he, well... You must have a hell of a loss with the, you were living in this place where there was a bathroom that had no window. Right. The detectives already know the bathroom had a boarded up window and are just slowly getting Carl to reveal the truth about the bathroom and the fact that it did have a window that he boarded up. Did you? Did yeah. lawsuit? No, because the place sued me. The oh, homeowner sued, sued me. For what? For burning down their freaking house. There was never any cause. There was mm -hmm. the only thing they could say was kerosene. And, uh, uh, so did you acknowledge it was some sort of neglectful thing? Or? No. They had no smoke detect for renting for California rental Cold. codes. They had nothing. And I can't get over this. Was I, it like an old window? Or was well, it? the window was like that big and it was boarded up. You should have sued their asses off. Oh, and I went, I had. Wait, I, did you board it up? What's that? Did you board it yeah, up? Yeah, we had to because it was no good. But you couldn't fit out of it. You couldn't put, you might be able to put a baby out of it. A baby. You and I are an uh, 80-pound woman. There's no way. You could. You, Why'd you board it up? Because it was all broken. The, the, everything the was shot. Broken? Oh, yeah. You know, and it's like the frame was shot. The, the mm -hmm. frame of the house was shot. And, um, when did you board it up? Like a, eight months before. Do you, do you love Sunday? I do. I really do. Even to, I mean, even to this minute, she had her demons coming into the marriage, which was her alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, but at the time, I never knew that. Why would she try to say, yeah? Uh, to get everything. What? The house. But there's nothing though, really, right? I mean, he's well, I got the farm. That's three hundred and some thousand. Because okay. she knew I was going to go after her for the house and the money for the girls. She has nothing. Yeah. What's suspicious? What's suspicious about Levi's death? In, in your opinion, what is suspicious about it? To me. To us. In your opinion, you're a smart guy. What? What, what do you? Why do you think we're suspicious of it? Just. I, don't, I guess your daughter's a cop, and she's yeah. a good cop. When you tell her, so she must cop. get that from you, be an analytical person. So, if you um, were in our seats, I don't know. I mean, well, I guess you can look at it. You know, what is suspicious? I, I, I guess it was. I don't. Do you see? I guess suspicious? because oh yeah, because I'm the last person that's seen him, mm -hmm. and I had the insurance. Well, that's fine. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that way. You know, there are a lot of people that. You know, you're the last one to see him. And, and I understand legally what has got to be looked into. I'm not stupid. I'd say I'm not a rocket scientist, but the way I am, yes. I understand what you're saying, believe me. I mean, I understand what you're looking at, and I don't know. Like there are some things that you don't know about. At this point, Carl must be wondering what else the detectives have on him that they haven't yet revealed. You're gone at the funeral, and I'm sorry to interrupt. How long were you got? You wouldn't still be gone at the funeral. Over four hours. Four hours. Four and a half, maybe a little longer. Think about that for a moment. Mm -hmm. The investigators are about to confront Carl and drop a bomb on his story. Do you know how accurate they can do with the cause of death based on body temperature and atmospheric temperature? I, all I know is what they tell me. The, it's, it's accurate. Within, what's it, three, 15, 25 minutes? Yeah, I bet maybe it was So there's a big problem. I mean, I don't know exactly. I mean, I'm thinking four and a half, maybe a little longer, because I know it was it was after 11 o'clock when we left, I think. And we didn't get back till it was like right around, I think, 430 or so. Right in, you know. We revisited all those things mm -hmm. and all the, the things that were done at that mm -hmm. time of his death. And we've sent him in to many places. They've gone to state police lab, the Monroe County lab. Oh. And analysis has been done that can put it within a 15 minute window. I mean, it's not as precise as we'd like it to be, but basically, or specifically, it was before he left. He died. Walk back in there. If you're being, if you're telling us the truth and saying you had a conversation with him, you're lying because he was dead at that no, time. No, I had a conversation with him, I'll tell you that. Okay. Well, he was, he was either dead when you walked in there no. or as you walked out. That's fact. No, well. I disagree because I know the conversation I had with him. Unless, unless, the only way is if he died while you were there or before you came in. You see what I'm saying? Well, I, I'm not sitting here speculating, but... 
you know, couldn't you die two minutes after I walked out the door? No, and that's the one thing that we beat no, them on. I mean, come on. No, that's what we beat them on. We gave right into the window based on Cindy and based on what you said, and the, the people who were there, like that fire crew and all that stuff, they were able to eliminate the possibility they died two minutes after. Or three minutes. There's a there's a window there, but it, when they start, they start, they reverse it. Well, and that's just a fact. That's that's kind of I mean, what it is. I mean, I think I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I can't I can't tell you something that isn't true. Well, but we don't want that. We want no, to and, no, and and I think you know we. I think Tom kind of, No, I'm just. I think Tom kind of took a leap of faith with you here, and, 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 and that's fine. And, 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 and I mean, I understand and I that, you guys um, are being as nice as you can about it and being as polite. I have nothing negative to say. I mean, yes, I cannot believe I'm in here. I Yes, I can't believe that... But there's something about Levi that haunts you, Carl. I, I know it does. Well, the thing that haunts me about it is that your son dies. Something more than that. No. Nothing else. Nothing else. When Cindy asks you, I know you have secrets. You come back with it so you think I killed Levi. Oh, by the way, she said on the, the, her one message to me. She was, I know you. I know... And Carl, nobody, the game that you say you're playing, nobody plays that game. Oh. Nobody's going to come out and say, I caused the death of my son because I'm going to try and ha-ha. And well, that's why, I, that's why I kept talking to the neighbors. As, as Tom pointed out, what's the end game? There isn't well, anything that makes sense. I, well, that's what I tried figuring out is that what is she after? And I, in my I think you're afraid to tell us what really no. happened. I, I know, in fact, I know. No. And I, I don't I, think, I, I know. And I don't know if it had to do with the drugs you were taking at the time. I, I don't know if it was because of what he was doing. At that time in his life, he had turned around. At that time in his life, for probably the last six, eight months. Let me tell you something, Carl. Your tone of voice doesn't say that thing when you talk well, about him. All right, you're not, we're not new with this. Come on. I know, but I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke up your butt and tell you that, you know, it, he... Carl, my butt's smoking, man. Well, letting the pressure be bigger than you. You are not able to tell the truth right now. It was right, in which I think you did I in a minute. All right, I, I did not kill anybody. Oh, that's just a message. There's no way I could have. But he was dead when I went in there. Okay. Tell us about that. Okay. You're doing great, buddy. You can do it. You can do it. I couldn't do it again. Let's talk about what, you, what happened. I walked in there, and... Walked in there to, you know, give him his money, and holy f And I just blank. Just... Hardest day of your life? <sighs> Why did you keep it a secret for so long? Well... I can knock you off the water. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. myself every day just like you said that so when you went back in he was he was dead okay. and I freaked I just like it's like it didn't happen there's no way you know I mean it's just I would give my life for that kid Carl has now proven himself to be a liar and he also places himself at the scene which is a step in the right direction and likely enough for a conviction. The officers will continue to press him to see if they can get him to admit Levi's death was intentional. But I f***ing freaked. I f***ing freaked. And can you imagine telling your family? Oh, I can't. I mean, can, I mean, you, can, you, no, can you imagine walking in? And... Day later, two days later. Given all of the evidence and mounting yeah. pressure of the interrogation, and he I likely know knows that with the physical car, evidence proving that Levi was deceased day. at the time Carl left the house, so you know he that. has two options. One, admit that he I'm killed sorry, Levi, or like, two, admit that he knew Levi was dead, but I didn't know. have anything to do I with knew. it. If you really truly you what you did. I knew, and he was... His legs were blue. The lieutenant is sitting uncomfortably close to Carl for a prolonged period of time. While he appears to be very supportive, sometimes patting him on the shoulder and frequently using his name, the close proximity may also be putting pressure on Carl to confess. 
Also, the lieutenant is being very nice and understanding to make him feel like he's his ally and will likely take on the role of good cop to another detective's bad cop. No, I picked it up when, to get him out when we come home. Okay. You know, and all it was was the jacket's like this wide, you know, narrow. Mm -hmm. And we had it under the front bumper. And the back two wheels were on the ground, so that's why it could teeter. But he must have been reefing on something because he still had the wrenches in his hands. I had to break it, almost break his fingers to get the wrenches out of his hands when, I, when we come home. I could never kill my kid. I don't give a damn if you gave me $20 billion. Carl, you've come this far, man. You're almost there. <laughs> I know. I, mean, I know. I did not. No way. No way in hell. The lieutenant puts his hand on Carl's shoulder again and gently confronts him. No way. I know he did. No, I didn't. He wasn't dead when he. When you, I did not. Did not push the truck over. No way. There's no way. No way. I think. I don't think you want no, to believe it. No, I know I didn't. But I think you had a good reason, and I really like to know what that reason is. I don't have a good reason because I didn't do it. Notice how quickly Carl goes from crying and making unemotional denials. And maybe it was, I don't know. I, I really like to know because. No, I didn't. I, I will never say I did because I didn't. So you came in there and you, and you found him dead. He, and you he, went what? back out with Cindy and spent four and a half hours. And all I could do just was just with that. It would be very unusual for someone in a state of panic about finding their child dead to then act normally for four plus hours, especially at a funeral, which may amplify one's thoughts about death, only to return home to act shocked and devastated. Doesn't really make sense. You don't know how hard it was. I just, it's just like, it didn't happen. It was like... Something you said to Cindy really stuck in my head, Carl. And, and, and it made me... I don't know, I kind of admire you for it. There was a time when, when you were talking to her, one of your conversations, and you said, what I did, having to live every day, was harder than anything else. Oh, it than, than if, just, that harder it, than if someone had killed me. I never, I, I could never, oh, I mean, what I seen that day and what I didn't do for him, I could never change. I could never change. I can never change. How do I tell my family? How do I tell my kids that, oh, geez, he was dead and I walked away? How do you do that? Oh, I, I can see where that would be difficult. You know, I mean, because every day it's in your head that I left him there when he needed me most. Yes, it killed him about as instant when you have a truck dropped on you, you know, and when it fell, it's, that's a lot of weight. I'm not stupid. I appreciate you being truthful with us in the fact that he was dead before you left there. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. You made a decision. There's no way you came out of that building having just been shocked with the fact that your son was dead. And nobody picks up on it. I don't unless know. you knew it was going to happen. No, no. It's impossible to believe. I'm that. sorry. You're I, selling I, yourself short. You are. I'm, not, you I'm, I'm not going to sit here and... I am not going to tell you I had anything to I do with nothing but the dead. This is what I'm telling you right now. You made a decision that day? I made, a, made, I, made, I made a decision to walk out on my son and not get him out from underneath the truck. Why? I panicked. Why, though? It's a great question. I, I, I panicked. I'm just like... Carl? I, well, I, I panicked. When we, and believe me, when we look like at the, at the reports and the deputies report and the things you said and the way you acted when the deputies arrived... That just doesn't... How did I get it when the deputies were right? I was bawling like a freaking baby. The lieutenant confronts Carl with evidence that contradicts his version of events. They will keep doing this throughout the interrogation to reveal the strength of evidence against him in the hopes he loses resolve and confesses. Right, four hours later. Yeah, four and a half hours later. Because I finally pulled him out and seen his face. And that just... Carol, it all come up. You're getting so close to me. I'm, I'm not going to tell I'm you being, I had anything to do with it. I'm not. So well, you, you I, can I know you're that. trying to... I, I can't. I'm not going to tell you something I, know I didn't you, do. Well, we don't want... Don't ever make any mistake in here. Oh, uh, I know. Don't, we, we, don't ever misconstrue what we want here. We only want the truth. 
I'm the one that jacked up, and I live with that every freaking day. Carl will only admit that he made the choice to jack up the truck. The detective exits the room again, leaving the lieutenant alone with Carl. It may feel less confrontational for Carl to be able to talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, and the detectives may feel Carl will be more likely to confess the actual truth. It should have been me under there. You know, you look, I mean... You know, I, I, know, I, think, I, I think that you probably really think that. I think you really I, wish that it was you. I do. I, look, I mean, look at me. I'm a train wreck. I don't think you're a bad person. And it's like, there's nothing that can justify killing your wife, your kids, your, your uncles, your parents, your... It may have been a slip of the tongue when Carl stated, there's nothing that can justify killing your wife, your kids, your uncles, your parents. At this point, he's been in the interrogation room talking for several hours, so it's not surprising that he may have messed up. It's possible that as soon as he let the word wife slip out, he realized his mistake, so he added in uncles and parents to try to throw the detective off. I mean, it'd be different, it'd be different if you killed the... I didn't say you killed your wife. No, I don't, but I'm just saying, you know, I mean, that's why I'm saying wife, kids, whatever. Carl, did well, you? No. No, I've already been through that. No, hell no, and no way in hell. With losing Levi is, we finally got him going in life. And Cindy and I talked about it. I said, finally. You know, it's like the load's lifted off. We don't have to babysit him. I don't know how many times we went down to the sheriff's department and bailed his ass out of trouble. Paying fines. I mean, thousands of dollars in fines. And it's like, holy crap, you know. And well, didn't he have a, I thought I saw when we were going over the past, uh, I thought he, he, he caused a, a CPS report to be blown in on you, too, for something like saying. He called all the time. Yeah, they got you, they hit him or something, and. Oh, yeah, well, I hit him. Then there was one about, because there was some kind of fight, because he accused you of killing his mother or something like that. No, no. I saw something like that. I don't know. No. It's strange how Levi once accused Carl of killing his mother in the fire, but then years later, Levi agrees to take out life insurance and have Carl as the sole beneficiary. This oddity is never brought up in this interrogation. The reasons why Levi would trust his father as the sole beneficiary after accusing Carl of killing his mother may never be known. Levi may have trusted his father later in life, as most sons do, regardless of the struggles and abuse he experienced in the past. It's also possible Carl lied to Levi about who would benefit from the life insurance payout. It had to be kind of mad. He didn't have CBS show up because he keeps making well, shit we, up. We just... The lieutenant is providing another motive as to why Carl may have wanted to kill Levi, beyond the money. In Carl's mind, Levi was responsible for getting him in trouble with the CPS. This may be another reason why Carl chose to kill Levi and have his death versus his other kids be the one he profits from. Let me tell you what I think, because you, about this whole thing, and I know that's not the same thing, but this is my opinion is that as soon as the detective says he wants to tell Carl what he thinks, Carl leans forward and faces slightly away from him. This body language indicates that he wants to avoid whatever the detective is about to say. He's also trying once again to garner sympathy by breathing heavily like he is in pain. It could also be related to a fight or flight response, which would increase the body's need for oxygen. As an outsider. You know what, there are some strange circumstances in your life. Uh, you know, your wife. I know, I know. That's so, bizarre. Believe me, I know. I have lived with everything, and it's like, you know. That's bizarre. We all, we all laugh about that. I would never find any reason to laugh at it. This is a rather disturbing statement, as there's nothing funny about losing both his wife and his son in freak accidents. I want to go back to this because this is... I've never read it, so... No. Have you seen it before? No. Do you know what it's about? No. The lieutenant returns with food for Carl, but he refuses it. Nonetheless, this is a gesture of goodwill, and also necessary so he can't say he was treated inhumanely there without food or water. Also, the more at ease Carl feels, the more likely he'll be to open up. You were the, you were the catalyst to helping your son get this insurance. That's what this says. Carl's claims contradict a witness statement from Levi's life insurance agent, Anthony, also referred to as Tony. In his statement, Tony said that Carl was the spokesperson for Levi when they went to get him insured. I think Tony wrote that or something. Yeah, that's kind of what it's, it well, kind of says it was like I you do, were pregnant. You look like 
The lieutenant scoots his chair in close to Carl again, aligning himself next to Carl and away from the other detective. This is likely done to make Carl feel like he's on his side and Carl can trust him. He's joking, laughing with him, and touching him like he's his pal. Well, that's, that's not that bad. He becomes much thinner. Thanks. He just looks thinner, I think. Oh, I was a lot thinner. This is when I was really cooking with drugs. I, just, I, mean, I don't know that kind of thing. It's a slightly different thing. Well, here's... We, I just got some more news that, that, that we should talk about. Mm -hmm. Now the lieutenant reveals another piece of evidence that he claims they just received. In actuality, this is untrue and just a tactic to make Carl uneasy and wonder if more things will continue to come out. Um, I had somebody interview this person. Okay. All right. And he says, right or wrong, just what he's saying, he says that you knew about the accidental part of the policy. See, I, I can't remember. Right. I, did. I can't. But here's the thing. All right, now that's now a matter of record. Right. Well, that's so fine. So he discussed it with you. Nevertheless, the lieutenant mentions the fact that Carl knew about the accidental death rider when he helped Levi sign up for the policy. Notice how Carl immediately leans away from the detective as he says this. He wants to put distance between himself and this seemingly new information, which is putting him in a negative light. Uh, I, like I say, so I, we're, it's starting to look more and more like the I insurance know. angle. I know. Which is why I, I don't think he's good at insurance. <laughs> well, I know you keep saying that. I know, time, but in black and white, yeah, it's what it's. But you know what? I think that if you're going to help yourself, I think you need to explain, Carl, because I, I, like I said, you and I are already on, yeah, but we're the, agreeing to disagree on the one right, thing that, that I know he has something to do with it. There's, but if you're going to let it go in this direction. No, I don't want it to go in that direction. It was, I it's never, going on its own. We're not making it go I know. in that direction. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I wish I, I know mean, you I've been problems. spending the last couple of weeks talking to her and thinking about things, and it's like... Well, I know you wanted to get back on her back. Know, well, and you... You said you loved her, and, and I think much, you do. And, and a lot of it was, and this is sad to say, I almost believed her that if I said what she wanted to hear, that she would take me back. Well, why would anybody want to hear this? Carl refuses to accept blame and now tries to claim illogically that he confessed to his wife so she would take him back. This makes no sense and he's getting desperate to come up with excuses. How long was she in Levi's life? Since he was seven. Okay. So there's no way you thought that she wanted to hear that. She wanted to hear the truth is what I'm assuming. I can't imagine you think that a mother wants to hear well, that's, well, a child. Well, that's the thing. It's, and I kept, that's why I kept talking to the neighbors. He's trying to build credibility and make his story more believable by claiming that he talked to his neighbors about Cindy setting him up. This is the exact strategy he used earlier on the same topic, except he had talked to his daughter about it. I talked to my daughter, and my daughter's like, she is setting you up. It's like, yes, but Carl, she never actually came out and said that you, that, that you didn't kill Levi. You did. I know. She but, didn't well, bring you, it up. Yeah, but you can tell. I kept, well, that's why I kept fishing for more. So why didn't you more. just tell her, hey, the truth is, he was dead when I walked in there? Because could you admit it? When asked why he didn't just tell his wife the truth, that Levi was dead when he walked in, Carl responded, could you admit it? Carl's story doesn't make logical sense that it was easier to tell his wife a lie that he killed Levi rather than the truth that Levi was dead when he walked in. Since I've been on all the medicine, there's times that I drive in a car and I get lost. And I get freaking panic attacks. If I, if I can't find my way out, I start, it's like, you almost want to say, I want my mother. And it's to do with the medicine. He's trying to give the detective evidence that he panicked when he found Levi dead, because he's a man who has a history of panicking. However, someone having a panic attack would not be able to go four and a half hours of acting normally, like Carl apparently did, after he found Levi dead. Panic attacks are also short-lived, usually lasting from a few minutes, but possibly up to an hour. I mean, there's a lot to do. I mean, and I'm not, I don't mean to keep coming back and bragging it up, but I went through four, six years of being stoned. I mean, you guys, you know, check my medical records, whatever, you probably will, but... It's, probably already did. Well, probably, I mean, <laughs> I mean it's, it's, it was tough, and it's like, you know, it's tough, it's tough. Carl is likely mentioning this repeatedly as a last resort defense if he has no way to say he didn't do it. 
He doesn't know what evidence the police have against him. I've been around long enough to know that there's circumstances where a parent might have to do that. Yeah, um, but it's it's not... I don't know what I would... If I had one of my kids and I knew that their life was going to be miserable because of the choices they were making, uh, I might make that same call. The lieutenant is trying to normalize what Carl did by saying he's seen it before in his career and that he may have made the same choice if he was in his position. None of this is true, as it's pretty rare to see a father kill his own child for insurance money. A spouse, maybe, but a child is rather rare. Most children don't even have life insurance until they themselves have a spouse or children. They would likely have the beneficiary be their own family, not their parent. But to sit here and say that I killed him, I... No. Well, like I said, I don't want to use that word. No, but it, it is. It's what it's, what it's I think all that, about. I think that... Or took his life, whatever you want to say. But yeah, it took his life like, well, or, like or, or took advantage. And I don't want to say advantage like it was something you got gained from. But, but saw what? a circumstance where it could be done humanely right. and quickly and did it. Because I'll tell you what, Carl. There's a, there's a, there, there's a part of you that's pretty, pretty hard. It's deep down. I don't know what happened to you when hard, you grew up. Wait, wait, wait. Hard. I think you can be hard when you have to be. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, there, there, there's some people in this world that are capable of making very hard decisions and taking hard action. There's some people who aren't. Most people aren't. There's only well, 1% yeah. of the population can do Horrific what, 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 when it's necessary. The lieutenant is describing what is, in actuality, his psychopathic personality as a positive thing to help him admit to being this type of person. I, and, and that happens uh, in the military. I, it happens. Right. And I think it's... it's I think some of it may be... I, I know you didn't grow up with the best of, well, of, of situations. I mean, I, we, we went... We, as hard as we worked, we played just as hard. We had snowmobiles. We raced them. We went to Disney World many, many times. We went to Daytona races. We, we did a lot. But as kids, we worked a lot. I mean, yes, if I had a tough life, yes. If I had a good life, yes. Mm, I've got good take, kids. Got I've, got, I mean, I've got grandkids. Um, and, you know, this situation with Levi, like I say, it's... Well, I, I, and, I would really appreciate it if you tell me what really well, happened in that garage. Because I, I, you and I both know that there's something else that happened. And, no, I, I... I would really appreciate it if you tell me about it. And I know, Carl, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something, a little quid pro quo here. You know what that means? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I'll I tell you something, you tell me something. I had one of my kids once was really sick. And you know what, if I could have helped that suffering, I would have taken her life. The detective is trying to normalize what Carl did by saying that he himself would have taken his own child's life if it meant it would stop her suffering. He's trying to make it easier for Carl to admit to killing Levi. No, I, I mean, if something like that, but the thing is, is Levi was turning around. Carl's response is odd, to say the least. Whether Levi's life was turning around or not shouldn't dictate whether he should or shouldn't kill him. A new detective by the name of Jeff Arnold enters the room. How are you doing? <laughs> we haven't been before, don't think, we haven't been a long time, but I don't think you remember me. No clue. Jeff Arnold. I worked at Ontario County. I'm the best guy at Ontario County. Mm, not quite sure. Don't mind me. I just. I think. I met and you. he feels better if he stands up. I, I move a lot. I, I met you. Uh, it was within within days of your son's death. Yeah, I. I was a I was investigating a matter um, involving your granddaughter. Did you ever hear anything about that? Let me just tell you what I'm here for, and then I'll let these guys talk. Okay. okay. I just just drove down from Ontario County. Can you can you sit for a couple minutes so yeah. I can just talk? It's it's tough to talk. You need me to step out, or um, you know, I don't think you mind. The detective asked the lieutenant to step out. They do this to change up the dynamic, once again, keeping Carl uncomfortable. Remember, interrogators want to be able to control the stress levels of the suspect, and this is another strategy to manage that. It's about using whatever means they think will work on that suspect to extract as much information in the shortest amount of time. This is an old case going back to uh, November 18, 2008. Do you uh, remember anything about that day a couple days before? Do you guys no. Do you remember 
what was going on in the life of your grandkids back then? Levi would bring them out at times, and I know they were in the nasty divorce, and you know it was over at that time, I believe. And but they were, you know, they were still fighting. Did anybody ever discuss my investigation with you back a long time ago? Probably not. Not that I know of. We, we, about what? We never, we never talked to you or Cindy about it because of the death of your son momentarily. Um, your granddaughter um, was years old at the time. I don't know what type of relationship you had with her, uh, but she had been. And there's, there was always a belief on Cassie's part that you knew about it. Oh, no. And it, it was pretty clear indication that uh, your son was involved in it. And no. she always believed that you knew about it. No. Carl doesn't appear to be surprised by the information that Levi was allegedly involved in assaulting his own daughter. Although he denied knowing or ever hearing about it before, he had been speaking so highly of Levi during the entire interrogation, so it's strange that he doesn't appear shocked by this accusation, or even try to defend Levi's memory by saying that it can't be true. It's possible that he isn't surprised because something like this isn't out of character for Levi, which is a direct contradiction to what he's been telling the other two detectives. It's also possible that perhaps he already knew about this allegation, but for some reason thinks he shouldn't admit to knowing. Or it could even be that he's such a callous person, he doesn't really care. If I knew about it and it was him, oh, that he never mentioned any, I mean, we never knew anything. Well, she believes it. She's always believed it. That you were aware of it. Never. And that he talked to you about it after, because we were coming after him. We never knew a thing. Never knew a thing. He never talked to me about it. Well, because we. Even were, if, he, if, he, if he did or didn't, it's, it's, it's surely not a crime. But, you know, we, keep, we don't close out these investigations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether it was him or somebody else, or, or we obviously don't know. So, um. I mean, was. I, it, I've been. Pardon me? Was it founded that she, did she go, they take her to the... No, I, I can't get into all the details oh. of that. And as you, yeah. I mean, was it, I guess, was it an accusation or was it... Oh, no, it was more than an accusation. Okay. I, I surely wouldn't be here for right. it. Oh, I didn't know, but no, we never... It's important to note that it isn't clear if there was actual evidence of Levi assaulting his daughter or if this is just an interrogation tactic. Because we were seeing the kids actually pretty much every week and a half to every two weeks he would, he would bring them by or we would get them for the day or they would spend the nights for sometimes two or three nights you know we would have them a lot and nobody ever made us the wiser of what was what was your son did you ever show any indication of anything like that when no. he was growing up did no. ever no abuse of animals or no. anything no it seems the detective is trying to posit a motive that Carl killed Levi because Levi allegedly assaulted his own daughter. He was never abused as a child. He was never... Well, you guys had some, some issues, though. Oh, well... I mean, let, let me... Yeah, go ahead. Let me picture. Let's talk about some of those issues because I got involved in this case. I don't know if you realize this, but this, this investigation of theirs has been going on for, for several months. No, I, I didn't know well, that. Again, I'm just, I'm telling you that I'm telling you the truth on that. Okay. That this isn't something that came overnight. Um, so when I was alerted to it, I, I've interjected a little bit here and there. Um, got to understand this investigation pretty well. Don't know all the details of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that you and Levi had some, quite a few confrontations. Well, he and his mother. So it was the three of us. Y y you... Correct. The new detective may be trying to get Carl to admit the problems in his relationship with Levi. Because if Carl admits to something small like that, it can make it easier for him to admit to something bigger. It's likely the detective is also trying to prove that Carl has not been truthful to the other detectives about Levi's issues. But the ones I'm talking about is I found a couple reports from Sheriff's Farm reports where you and Levi had almost some almost physical confrontations where the sheriffs were called. Do you, you recall those? Well, he told them one time that I beat him up so bad that he was spitting blood. First one was back in 2000, 
um, where he reported that you threatened to kill him. Do you remember that? that that's what's on the sheriff's report? No. Was there, do you remember why, what was the cause of the I anger? Don't even, I don't even know. He was probably like 13, 14 years old. I don't know. I mean, I know was he I an outrageous punk in your, in your oh, family? No, no. He, he was one that he would lie, steal. He stole three, four hundred dollars from his sister and wouldn't admit it, wouldn't admit it while the school's saying, why well, sleeve I got all these dollar bills and he's handing them out to everybody. Right. My daughter worked as a waitress. So he'd come home and Aaron's like pissed because all her money's missing. And it's all mostly one dollar bill. So he wouldn't say nothing, so I set him in a chair in the living room and I said, we're gonna sit here till you tell me what you did with money. I said, I know you got it, I know you spent it, and you've been giving it to kids at school. Finally, he come clean, and I didn't punish him. I said, you're gonna have to tell your sister you took her money. That killed him. There was another one where he um, called her, called the ex-wife, or no, Cindy, uh, F and da 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 da, and something else. She called me and said, geez. She, put, wait, she called your wife a what? Al, or Levi called my wife a F and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, How old is Levi? 16, 17. He, was, he, he put her, your wife through love and help. He put all of us. And so, now, how, other than that, you say he put his wife, it sounds like he was not a good kid growing up. The detective is trying to demonize Levi to get Carl to admit his true feelings about Levi. He so, wasn't bad. He, he stayed, oh, no, no. If he, I told, to call my mother, oh, that, no, that, was, that would have been my that, last day of well, life. That was his only one time that he ever said that to her. But how did you handle it? Well, I called him up and I said, what did you just say to your mother? Was he not living at home? No, at this time. And I said, what the hell did you do? He said, well, she won't give me my fucking money and she bitching and this and that. And I said, you will never, ever talk to her like that again. And he had quit, quit school and all his, a couple of his buddies quit school. So he wasn't into drugs that I know of. Your son, I've done an extensive amount of work on him. Mm -hmm. He wasn't that nice of a guy. Yeah. I mean, he may have had some qualities that were okay. But, well, the thing is, though, is as the, far as the, what the, he the, ever the told The dark him, side of him, there was a dark side of him. Uh, if your father was like my father, he'd have kicked your ass to, to the moon. He wouldn't have wasted a bullet on him because he would have beat you to death. Right. That's my point that I'm saying. Yeah, and is I, that the realization but at is the that, point, we'd already been through the child protective enough to where... I'm not here going to tell you, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I have a love affair with your son Levi. I'm not telling you that no, Levi was no, a great kid. No. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm not well, going to be I'm like, what I'm saying though is that we knew that if I laid a hand on him, which our dads would have beat us to death, CPS is going to have me by the balls because... In today's world. And, right. and, and, but even back when he was doing it, because well, that was he, turned us in, he turned us in, he turned us in, he turned us in, and it's like, so now I can't, and I have he CPS. Turned into CPS did he? Oh, many times. And every time he... Come on, that didn't make it look like hell. But every time he turned us in, it was proven not guilty. Every time, you know, every time. Yeah, still report on your record. Yeah. Was there for and I says, you know, it's not fair that we get accused of something. It stays on our record, and he gets to walk home clean because he lied. And they said, well, that's the system. And um, there was one time that he grabbed me, I grabbed him. We never punched. We just had a hold of each other. How old was he then? 17, 17 and a half. And I said, look, I says, you're done. Out of the house, don't come back till you're ready. Multiple accounts allege that Carl was very abusive toward his children. A statement from Cindy dated April of 2012 references two occasions when Child Protective Services became involved in altercations between Levi and Carl. According to Cindy, Carl would hit Levi. Also within a statement, Levi's older sister, Erin, explains that Levi was Carl's preference when it came to beating the children. Erin stated, I had it bad, but Levi got it worse. Erin's words would prove to be quite the understatement in the end. He finally started changing his ways and was doing better. And I says, all right, go down and put an application in and I'll talk to him. And I did. And I put my reputation on the line, which at that time I was almost like God down there, you know. Once again, Carl displays his narcissistic traits. Not only does he show a lack of empathy for his son, but he also appears to think he's better or superior to others. He even states that at work he was almost like God. 
Of course, many would find this claim to be quite disputable. And he was doing fantastic. Fantastic. Tom was telling me um, about a fire with your first wife that concerned him back in, what year was that? 90. Maybe 90, 91, I think, 91. Okay. So that fire caused the death of your wife, correct? Correct. Right. And the fire, according to him, it started because you spilled kerosene in front of the bathroom? Well, uh, the dog and the wife did. The dog and the wife she spilled car kerosene? She, she carried kerosene in for the kerosene heaters we had. So the dog tipped the kerosene over. Right. Was that how the fire started? No, that's it spilled, and then the fire never happened for like three, two weeks, maybe. So, but two or three weeks prior to yeah. kerosene spills. And we cleaned it all up. I mean, we soaked it. I thought the kerosene caused the fire. What caused the fire? They never really, the only thing they aimed is because she had a load of clothes in the dryer. And that was a, a gas dryer, you said? Yes. Right? You sure it's gas? I was also working up in the attic that day. In the house? Yeah. Uh, because there's a... Could have something dropped, like a light? Well, I had a down. trouble light they found on the floor. Oh, so you think maybe that trouble light fell and down? And that's what they checked. Right where the fire was is where the light was. Evidently, he made the light up here. Oh, it wasn't a fire. There was no criminal charges. Carl throws in the statement that there were no criminal charges regarding the fire. This isn't responsive to a question and seems to come out of nowhere. Again, this shows a consciousness of guilt. Where's the front door and porch? Can you draw that on there for me? The detective has Carl draw a map of the home and how he went into the house to pull his kids out. This is done to get his testimony clearly on record. This is a step in the read technique to reduce things to writing or maps to make the interrogation answers more concrete and undeniable. The detective may also be having Carl draw out a map of his house and talk about the fire in order to try to catch inconsistencies with which to confront him. So you come up, you come up on this porch here? I come up to the porch because I was going to go in there, but you, I couldn't even see through the glass. There's a glass door. So you didn't open the door here? I didn't open the door. His window was right there. So I just punched the screen and then bang. And then you, you get hit with a flash. Carl appears to be very comfortable telling the story about the fire. And he doesn't appear to be rattled by any of the questions about what happened that day. He's probably told this story many times. He may even enjoy telling it because he likely believes that it proves that he is such a brave man, risking his life to save his children. Did the insurance company ever do an interview with you? Because typically, they, insurance they, company. they never did an interview with you with lawyers and stuff? Because no. typically on a payout of insurance, they no. do an extensive... Oh, not a thing. It was ruled accidental. Boom, did... boom, boom. I'm burnt. I'm tired. I'm hurt. I'm wearing clothes from everybody that has donated them. And somebody took the kids. I didn't see the kids for two or three days. Really? Yeah, because I was a wreck. Once again, Carl is making the tragedy all about him, rather than thinking about his children or his wife. He doesn't even mention how he lost his wife or the kids lost their mother. What did you do when your brother and son came off? Cry. I mean, you said, where did you sit? Did you sit around the house? Or? I laid on the couch, folded into a bed, and I slept on it for two days. And you stayed right there until the minute you came back to New York, or did yeah. you finally get up and do anything? No, I stayed right there. Yes, you didn't get the... I mean, I went to, we had funeral and all that stuff and everything else, but I just... That was it? Yeah, no. I, was, I mean, I was trying to heal up myself, but I was a freaking train wreck. While he tries to paint himself as such a caring family man, his actions speak otherwise. A man who tragically just lost his wife and risked his own life to save his young children likely wouldn't choose to nurse his wounds alone and not see his kids for days right after the accident. Tom was saying there was some, some of his concerns he was telling me tonight is that there were some other fires, like a car fire you had and a, and a barn fire, and cow fire, I, something. I had, they were... Yeah, I had a barn fire, but they proved that that was... Um... What, what was the barn fire? It, it, um, it ended up being the barn had cloth wiring in it. Carl retells his story of what caused the barn fire that killed his horses to the detective. He again blames faulty cloth wiring. According to Tom, there was a, a large insurance policy on that also. All I got was 60000 
That was with. Oh, I thought you said it was like a hundred thousand because you yeah. had like the animals insured for like thirty thousand. No, I had one animal insured for twenty. She was the largest mare in the world, thirty-two hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Never one like the otters. So you that must have been more expensive horse. How much? How much was that horse worth? A lot. Would you realistically, pay for that? realistically, she's probably worth about eighty to hundred thousand dollars. What Carl doesn't realize is that the interrogators are well aware that Carl's prized horse was infertile. Because the horse couldn't have offspring for Carl to make a profit on, he found another way to make money through insurance fraud. When do you put the more insurance on the barns? How long prior to the fire? I don't know, it was three months, four months. Now you've got me totally confused here. When I come back, you're sleeping. Right. Well, listen, listen, baby. Yeah, I, I, you're, 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 I'm getting you're sleeping, down. and you get up at what time? Do you remember? It was probably 11 o'clock, midnight, maybe, if it uh, wasn't even that. The detective establishes a timeline for the fire involving the horse barn. He's reducing this to writing so he can make sure it's solidified in case it doesn't match the evidence or his prior statements. I said, call 911 or call, call the fire department or something, and I said, call the brothers, because I have five other brothers. One item to note regarding the barn fire and a statement from Carl's own brother, Curtis, who was a career firefighter and also responded to the fire. Curtis requested that the fire chief do an investigation due to his own suspicions about the fire. The chief declined, but Curtis knew something about that fire just wasn't right. Carl's M.O. is becoming very clear. He takes out an insurance policy, waits a matter of weeks, an accident occurs. Then, as the primary beneficiary, he gets a large payout. This seems to be the only thing he cares about. He has no issue trading the lives of animals, wives, or kids for money. The detective now proceeds to question Carl on another fire. Let's just cover, cover a couple of the yeah. fires that Tom had mentioned mm -hmm. that he was concerned about. Was there one that you had a car back in 1996? Oh, no, it was back in 80. 86. Carl discusses a car he had that suspiciously caught on fire in his driveway. I bought a brand new Dodge Charger, 2.2. .2. Payments on it? Yeah. And, um... I mean, I put money down and everything. Right. And um, it was just months old. Took it back, saying we're smelling gas. How'd it burn? Um, Driving up the road? No, it was in my driveway. Just sit in there and burned up? Got home, shut it off, walked in the house, and uh, I went upstairs. She yells out, the car's on fire. Which was like... The car caught on fire. He also said that the fire department report said that you had removed all the contents from it just before the fire? No. No? That's no. not true? No. The detective is gently confronting Carl using evidence from the fire department that proves this was likely arson, and he still continues to deny it. What the well, you seem, very, you seem very truthful when you say that. Yeah, I mean, no. It's like, what the hell would be in You know why a fire department wrote that up on a report? No. I haven't read the report. I don't know. I don't know. I mean... I don't think I ever talked to anybody, really. As Cindy had grown more and more suspicious of Carl, she started to reach out to her family to see if they recalled anything about him that might have triggered alarm bells. Her brother remembered a story that Carl told him about how his parents had owned peacocks that would pull up the flowers and leave messes on the porch. The peacocks suddenly started going missing, and Carl told everyone that he had seen a fox, and it was likely killing the peacocks. However, Carl's father accused a relative of shooting them and threatened to call the sheriff's office if he could prove it. The relative was distraught at the accusation, but Carl allowed them to take the blame, even though he'd been killing the peacocks one by one for no reason except to perhaps get back at his father. In another disturbing instance, Carl killed geese on the property, and his father once again blamed the relative for shooting them. In fact, Carl admitted to Cindy's brother that while killing the geese, he hit one of the animals on the side of the head, and it flopped around for a bit. So Carl picked up and swung it around and wrung its neck. Cindy was horrified to find out that she had lived with Carl for 18 years and not realized he could be so cruel. The detective brings up an intriguing new fact. Did you work for the fire department back then? I used to be back in high school a volunteer fireman for the Varick. Mm -hmm. How long were you fireman for? Three, four years, maybe. It's quite surprising that Carl used to be a volunteer fireman, given the fact that he experienced three accidental fires, his car, his barn, and his house. As a volunteer fireman, he would have gained important knowledge about how to safely put fires out, 
how to rescue people from fires, and possibly how the cause of fires can be traced after the fact. It's strange that he never mentioned his fire training during the interrogation when he was telling detectives about the fire in which his wife died. In fact, he doesn't appear to have much knowledge about fires when he's giving details about his house fire. He likely doesn't want to draw attention to the fact that he had fire training, as that could make things look more suspicious. Believe it or not, it is fairly common for arsonists to be well aware about fire safety. In fact, there is an estimated 100 arrests of firefighters who are charged with arson every year in the United States. The detective brings up yet more fires to discuss. Was there a fire at Guardian Glass before you left there? Yeah. What happened with that fire? We had a fire out on one of my trains there that uh, the mechanic left a rag on top of the exhaust manifold. Started that fire? No, it just singed it. Any other fires? No, not that I know of. Wait, one. I did Your son. One. How about? I remember when I was looking at Levi years Levi ago. Levi had a house fire. How did that happen? I don't know. He said it was classified as an arson. But was, was Levi working that night? Or do you think he could have set that fire? As, they never should have owned the house. He said, jump right next to the oh, road. Was Ten feet from the road. Ten feet from the road. If my kid owned that house, I was we, we'd, we'd be having some words. Well, we did. I, um, he comes over, he's like, oh. It's a July. It's, do you ever see that, that, that movie, The Money Pit? Yes. Remember that house that was impossible to fix up? And it, you could, even if they gave it to you for free, you were going to go bankrupt fixing up. Well, it's like. Well, Levi and his wife, Cassie Block, well, she, was the money pit, wasn't yeah, that? What I do is I blame the people who sold them. I said, who in their right mind? And it was one of those houses. But it was the money pit, was it not? It was worse than that. It should have been condemned. The detective is establishing a motive for Carl wanting to burn it down as it was a money pit. It's shocking that Carl wasn't investigated as a serial arsonist years ago, as no one has this many incidents of accidental fires in their family. Do you remember where you were the night of that fire? Were you around that night? I have no idea. I didn't know about the fire for two or three days. His claim that he didn't know about the fire for days is extremely hard to believe, as Levi seemed very reliant on Carl. A fire such as that would be heard about in a small rural town like Clifton Springs, New York. Hmm. You know, did, what, you, I don't did know. you know it was classified as an arson fire? Never knew anything about it. I never heard a report, never nobody talked to us, nobody, nothing. It was classified as an arson, and it's hard to say if he did this or if his son just learned from his father how to get money and get rid of a liability. Do you know where your son and daughter-in-law were then? They were working. They were both working? They were both working, and I think the kids were at her mother's, as far as I know. According to Cassie, Levi's ex-wife, Carl was angry the young couple bought the home after all. I got a funny feeling we were in North Carolina at the time the fire happened. Oh, you were in North Carolina? I think we were in North Carolina, because that's why I think we didn't hear about it. For well, if you're in North Carolina, you feel you have anything to do with that, right? Oh, I, no, I did not have anything to do with it. I think there's a thought that you were so disgusted with him buying his house that... Why would I do that? Come on. I didn't say that. No, I'm saying but, thoughts there, so. No, I, I, guess. Did, I didn't know anything about any of his business money-wise. I don't know what they paid. How much money was, was Levi making? With over, I mean, with overtime and stuff, he was probably bringing home five, six hundred a week. Plus all, plus you get your bonuses. Five, six weeks. Carl changes his story about his involvement in Levi's finances, now claiming he knew nothing about them. The detective begins asking him about Levi's death and what he and the other detective and lieutenant spoke about. He already knows and is asking just to see how Carl retells it. I think they're looking at it either I did it or it's a for the money. And it's bullcrap. The detective now explicitly ties together all the insurance payouts Carl got, so he's forced to see the obviousness of his M.O. Levi was a healthy young man? Um, he... He got pneumonia when he was like 18. Um, they called me and said, your kid's in the emergency room. And he wasn't in Geneva Hospital long, and they were, he, his lungs collapsed. Really? And they took him up when to Rochester. he was Rochester. 18 years old? Yeah. Did he have any other health issues that would prevent him from getting that life insurance policy? No, not that I know of at all. He told me what he wanted to do. He, you know, told um, Tony what he wanted, and we did it. And I told him, I'll pay the first premium. He can't afford to pay for it that day? 
No, he didn't have anything on. He doesn't have any money. And to start it, you got to... What do you mean he didn't have anything on? He didn't have any cash on him. Not that amount. Did he have a checkbook with him? No, he didn't have a checkbook. Did he have the money in the bank back home? I don't know. Probably not, right? I, I don't know. But he, he, he had money. So why did you offer to pay for it, huh? He didn't have any money with him, and the guy needed his checks. Carl can't logically explain why Levi couldn't pay for the first insurance payment, which was only $300. It's likely Carl agreed to pay for Levi's insurance if he was the beneficiary, knowing he would only be making one payment. He has to have a physical before it's legal. But well, you knew that his policy was it was in it was his policy was good up until the day no. he got his policy. I never no? knew that. Okay. I was told. I thought I was told that so you have to get this before it. You know, everything's here. We got the check. We can do this. We can do this. But it doesn't go forward till you get the metal insurance policy. And who told you that? I thought that's what we discussed that day. That Chris and like with my Chris, Chrissy guy. Right. And then with my insurance that I have on me, it was the same way. I mean, I... How much life insurance did you have on you? I have 300 on me. Okay. And, but the wife doesn't have any on her, anything like that. Did your wife ever have any on her? No. So, the way she always Cindy said, never had any life insurance policy on her? No. The way she always... And did you, you have one on, did you have one on her? No. No. So there's never insurance policy on Cindy? No. The only thing I had on me was... Not a universal life, a whole life, or a term nothing. life. Nothing to do with life insurance nothing. on Cindy. Nothing at all. So if she would have died, you would have collected nothing. Right. Most interesting of all in this section, Carl states there is no policy on Cindy. In actuality, however, Carl holds a $1.2 million policy on her. Based on Carl's track record, the thought of another policy on a loved one is alarming. However, not as alarming as what you'll soon learn. Take a listen to what Carl has to say next. How about, how about your granddaughters? Was there a policy on your granddaughters that had life insurance policy? I think we did, but that was the way Tony... I'm trying to think here. My mind's going to think. We put, paid like six or $7,000 to get their life insurance started. That ended after so many years. You wouldn't have to pay into it. Right. You know that, that's what we call the universal life or a whole life policy. Carl now reveals the chilling fact that he has life insurance policies on his granddaughters. These are very young children, and it's extremely rare to have them insured. They were likely targets for Carl as well, and may have been killed next had Carl needed money again. Carl clearly has an inflated ego and may have thought he was too smart to get caught. In his mind, he'd already gotten away with multiple fires and insurance payouts with no legal repercussions. So he may have had a plan to continue down this road. One trait of a psychopath is living a parasitic lifestyle. Although this is commonly thought of as an indulged adult child mooching off their parents, Carl relying on insurance money to fund his life could be seen as parasitic as well. Can you give me an accounting? Uh, how much money did you get? Like seven hundred thousand. A little bit over seven hundred, right? Seven fifteen, seven ten. I, I don't know. This is what he wanted to do. So um, he like, wanted you to get a lot of it. Yes, in which was like, and, and he knew I would do anything for these kids. Right. How was your finances at the time, Obi? Not bad. I mean, I was working. She was. You working. had money in the bank. You were yep. good. Yep. You weren't looking at selling the house, the farm, to no, get out of or anything. No. No. Okay. The farm. So there was no. Farm. You had a nice retirement account set up at that time. Yep. Did, farm, farm. At the time of Levi's death, how much money did you and your wife have in your retirement accounts? Eighty some. Well, yeah. we, it was uh, it was over a hundred, and then the stock market took the. In two thousand eight, went right about the same time. We, we took time. a beating. I mean, I went down to like thirty thousand. So then, it, it right about the time of Levi's death, probably right. It took a beating. But you went from over a hundred thousand down to thirty thousand in your retirement account. In my retirement, yes. Right. Any money in the bank at the time? Yeah, we had normal living expense money, you know. Okay. We had money that we always have a big... So you didn't take a lavish lifestyle from the death of your son. No. It was really all just put into retirements and investment money. Yeah, I mean, we did So your 400000 was put into retirement. My farm was paid for. My trucks were paid for. Right, but I'm saying the 400000 that you and Cindy took... Right, we didn't... You put, that, you put that into a retirement investment. So you didn't go out and live a lavish no. lifestyle with it. You just paid for your retirement account. Right. You, you've got your retirement account back up to what, something of realization. Yeah. Where you now at least maybe someday retire. Well, that's the thing because we knew my health wasn't the best because of all the back surgeries. And, um, you know, we knew that sooner or later I wasn't going to be able to work.
Carl may have unintentionally given evidence for a financial motive, stating that physically he'd only be able to work so much longer and that he barely had any money saved for retirement. He's extremely talkative, and by this point, he's established a good rapport with the detective, so it's not surprising that he may slip up and say something incriminating. He's established a motive to kill Levi for the money without even realizing it. I want you to go over the true events, and I want you to be totally honest okay. with me. I think there's been some deception that's kind of got you a little bit jammed up over the last, since Tom has been talking to you, and Tom and Lieutenant Clear. Um, now that you, your head's clear and you've got past really some of the ones. Inaccuracies. The detective now gets to the real crux of the matter and confronts Carl about lying previously. He refers to Carl's lies as inaccuracies to minimize his intentional lying. He wants the honest story. There was some inaccuracies from what Tom was saying. Right. Tell me again the true events of how it came about that Levi was coming over to your house that day yep, he, and he, what happened when he got he there. He made plans like he always does. He asked me if he could come over to work on his truck. You grew up on a farm, right? Yeah. You worked on the machinery your whole Everything. Life. Me too. I worked on cars, you know, tractors. The detective is continuing to build trust with Carl by bringing up a commonality, growing up on a farm. He wants to make Carl feel like they're similar people and that he can talk to him. My farm was my grandfather's. I think some of what you're going to be telling me is we always jacked everything. We had a big, we had a big old railroad jack. Because my grandfather was a railroad man. So we and every farm had a railroad jack. Big Bellac freaking railroad jack weighed about 80 pounds. They could lift the house up. They could the lift the house, but they were as stable as Right. How many times did yours tip over? Uh, I think like most farmers, we all, and we, once we jacked it up, we blocked it with well, big wood blocks. When you can find them. But, or uh, even concrete well, blocks. Yeah, any, well, and it was, or we put a tire on the wheel, we would always say. Uh, He's also telling him about his knowledge, so Carl will be less inclined to lie about the jacks and equipment knowing he has a knowledge base in this area. Remember, Carl is talking about the Jack that supposedly is responsible for killing his son. Not many parents would be able to stomach discussing a tool supposedly responsible for killing their own child so loosely. It was a real Jack. One of those, you know, they, they jack it up that high, but... But the base was only... That wide, six, eight that inches. long, right. that little tooth that picks them up. Right, and they have about a two-inch in diameter stem that comes Yep, up. square stem, right. and it's that click. Yep. It's like, and letting them down was the scariest thing in the world. Sure was. You never want to let them Get down. your finger in there and you're clicking it one step at a time. And it just drops, boom. And a lot of times you click it the wrong spot and you push that lever and it's gone. I, and, I um, push that lever a thousand times in my life. Carl takes the detective through events leading up to finding Levi. We pick up where Carl says he revisited Levi's body after being at a funeral with Cindy for over four hours. And what did you do? I mean, you already know and he's not going to be alive. I knew, or... but it was like... You think he was going to come back to life? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. And then all of a sudden it's like... I jacked it up. And did the, your husband get the truck off of him? He was jacking it up when I was just out there. Pulled him out. And when I seen his face, it was like the switch turned on to reality. He's pinned underneath the uh, truck? Yeah, my husband's lifting up the truck. Honestly, I don't think he's alive. And his body had been lifeless for like four and a half hours? Five hours, whatever, whatever time. And what did you do to him when you took him off? Did you hug him? Oh, yeah, I laid right with him and cried like a baby. And then at what point, how long did you lay there? Well, I, I, well as soon as I pulled him out, and it really, when I seen his face, it clicked. That he's dead. I ran to the house, and I don't run. I beat on the door, told her. I come out, she... You were came. shocked that he was just found dead. Which well, you actually found dead four and a half hours yeah, ago. Well, I was shocked when I seen his face. Well, they want to start CPR. Do you know CPR? Justice Christ. He was actually dead. Yeah, it's like, this can't be happening. Yeah, I mean, and I, like I told them, I'm not going to make any excuse that I was on a load of drugs. I've been on drugs for a long time, and a lot of them. I bawled like a baby. About what? My son's dead. And for some reason, I could just set it back there for those hours and just stare at the wall. The psychopathy that one must have to pull this charade off is extraordinary. Do you think anybody's going to believe that you 
So I just hung there. Would you mind if I just stand up again? When Carl asked to stand up, he was likely trying to escape from the detective's intense questioning. Can you just, listen to me one second. Let me just get to this. You didn't feel the need at that point in time in your life to call. Because you knew that, that Levi's death was, he was better off, as you said, dead than no, alive. No, no. Do you think he was again, better off? I think alive? He was really coming around. It, it, the kid that I knew. But let, my wife will tell you. I mean, he, he let, let's, her let's mother's. Go over, let's go over. Let's play the audio tape of you and Cindy. No, I know it. We don't no, no, I think we really should play it because I think you need to clarify some things for us. Otherwise, we're all going to have a really look, a, a misunderstanding of what happened. I mean, not look at Can I say? You, you, you I really, have a chance. I really. Take my hand one second. You've dug this hole, Carl. I'm here. Uh, I can feel your hand shaking. My, my hand here. always shakes. No, I want you right now. Look, I'm, I'm here pulling out. You, you've got a little hole dug here. A big hole. The detective points out that Carl is shaking and moves his chair into Carl's personal space. He's now pointing to his body language to show his deception. He takes a more aggressive tone with Carl and begins confronting him more intensely. This is a tactical move, and he's also likely getting frustrated with the lies Carl keeps perpetuating. There is a reason why that we, you and me are sitting here. Oh, I agree. I, it's I, I, not just because of Cindy. It's because that, that, that accident, that death to your son, is uh -huh. why we're both sitting here right now. Well, I that mean, insurance policy is why we're here. That fire is why we're here. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. What are you sorry about? I'm sorry that everybody's here for this when I understand with, with Levi. I, I want to. I want to have you the investigators bring in our audio recorder. Do you so mind we, if I stand? I really. I'm. Please stand up. You do not know how bad this is. While you stand up, I, I want to get. I want to talk to the investigators and find out some All right, some information. Fine. Can I go to the bathroom too? Take you a sure I just gotta take a leak. Carl wipes sweat off his face which is an indication that he's feeling very stressed and visibly nervous. After he asks for a bathroom break and the detective leaves the room, Carl is probably panicking. His mind is likely racing, searching for some way to talk himself out of the situation he's now facing. Carl has his hand over his face, indicating body language of wanting to hide and disappear. He's clearly uncomfortable with the proposition that he will have to listen to his confession in front of the police and try to explain it away. The lieutenant and detective have Carl literally backed into a corner by the way they have their chairs positioned. They're sitting extremely close to him, and the lieutenant is speaking in a low tone, gently pleading for him to come clean. So, you know, Carl, I really think that the John Carl talking I mean, you look at everything laid out from the California prior to now, mm -hmm. I mean, Pretty damning evidence. Oh, I know. I've always, I've always known that. So that's why I'm what I think you need to do is look at Daniel Damage Control. I mean, you come straight out of Levi. Oh, maybe the other stuff. No, 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 no. I'm not even going to go there. Because no, no, no. I'm telling you now, that story just doesn't hold up. To your house. It doesn't make sense. There's no way that you walk away from your son and leave him there thinking he's pretty oh. much deceased and then go away for four and a half hours and then come back you don't, and then put on a big show with everybody. Like I told him. When I'm not problem. Problem. Yes, I'm, buddy. I'm not. <laughs> the, 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 when, when it's like I told this gentleman, when I pulled him out and I seen his face, it was like it was real. It was like it was so, real. So a guy like you that's mechanically minded and knows how to jack up a car you jack it up wrong. And you're well, I didn't jack it up wrong. I mean, I jack, he knows the kind of jack I'm talking about. I know the kind of jack, and, and I know from being on a farm my whole life, none of us would ever jack up and leave, let our son ever get under jack with a single railroad jack on it. The most tippiest things in the world. Well, it had blocks under the drums because the tires were off. The tires were off, and the thing was up on a single jack, right. a, a pivot point. Just as you just just as you described right. it, Cindy, you described it right to the T yeah, you, on how you set it up, inject it more, inject it more, inject it more. You go on with this conversation and you say to her, "Just hear me out. It was never meant to be. You know what I'm saying? It was never planned from the day one for this ever go this way." And Cindy says, "What do you mean day one? Like you know what the time the insurance stuff." The lieutenant places his hand on Carl's shoulder as the detective confronts Carl with his own words confessing to the crime. 
This is an extremely pressure-filled position they have him in. Coming out of the garage, it was like then, it was like nothing happened, you know. It was like being a hurricane and being an eye. Remember saying that to her? Mm -hmm. And what I mean? And again, she says, okay, tell me how it happened, just what happened. I asked him if he wanted to make some money because he was usually short on money. If he could just pull off these two lines, one from the transmission, one from the brake. Mm -hmm. And because they had the tires up, talks about being wobbly. And the ability, there was, you remember talking about describing how it was like a wheelbarrow? You jacked it up so it was like a wheelbarrow. Right. Backwards. Did your wheelbarrow analogy, the wheelbarrow analogy you told Cindy, is that accurate? Well, yeah, it could, yeah, oh yeah. But, and it just shook, easy to push over. And she asked you, does it push hard? And you said, no, it was easy. It pushed easy. Right. Do you remember saying that? That it pushed guess, easy. Yeah, I guess. I, it, I, doesn't, it, it doesn't actually push easy. And she asked you, did he feel any pain? Remember that? No. I and don't. you said, no, you don't think so. You think it was instantaneous. The detective points out how illogical his statement is, and Carl is dancing around answering and can't explain it because it doesn't make sense, and he is realizing that now. I think he was trying to trap you. And I says, what, what else could it be your motive? What's, what's, and, what do you want to be her motive? What is her motive? I don't know. Carl tries to keep flipping things back on Cindy and what her motive was. However, he's still unable to give any reason as to what he was hoping to gain by lying to Cindy, probably because there's no explanation that would make sense. She was waiting for that one word. What word? That I must have killed him or something. That's all I could think of. Did you not tell him that... Sickening, you admitted to pushing a truck over on your son. Yeah, to feed the furnace. Feed the furnace. Come on. Feed the furnace. Who would kill their kid? And then you think you're being set up, Carl. Why in God's name would you go in there and say that? Because I guess part of me was hoping. What, that she'd say, okay. Yeah. you want somebody back that you well, let then, hold her and kill your, it, their, your, your son? It doesn't make sense. It, well, I'm just, I'm just. Let's look at the totality of everything. Yeah. Carl takes a deep sigh and hangs his head, which is a sign that he may be starting to give in to the pressure and may confess soon. Seeing this body language, the officer should go in relentlessly. Let's think of the house fire where your wife was wrecked, she dies, and the, board, the windows boarded up days beforehand. You told the investigators there earlier that it was eight months ago that you boarded that window up in that bathroom prior to the fire. Eight months, you said. When did you board it up? Like a, eight months before? I don't know for word for you I told You told me a month and a half. How many months would you say beforehand? It's got to be a month or so. Maybe a month and a half. I thought it was like a month and a half. I don't know. And, and you tell investigators, my notes are little, you tell the investigators in the California Police Department back then that it was two to three days prior to the fire. Right. So two to three days, month and a half, eight months. Well, you're, you're talking 20 some years ago. You drew the picture to perfection. Well, the house, the, the house wasn't a big deal, because come on. You talked about a life insurance policy that you said was several, four, five, six months prior to taking it out on the death. Three, four months or something. Oh, okay, yeah. so it was a significant, well, actually, that's not a long time. We know for factual that it wasn't I, I the said, case I said, at all. No, I said it was a matter of weeks beforehand. A short term before the fire starts and takes your wife's life. Really? I thought it was like four months. You tell me that the kerosene was brought in to the house. Right. Then they, to fuel a kerosene furnace. Right. Yet you tell investigators back then in 1991 that it was mistakenly, you thought it was water. You brought in the house as a five gallon jug of water mm -hmm. to fuel the, to put in the toilet, to flush the toilet because your pipes were frozen. Right. And it mistakenly kerosene was brought in and knocked oh, on the floor. Absolutely. But yeah, you tell me kerosene. Yeah, but you're... And, and then you tell me that a dog knocks over a five-gallon bucket. Easy. Not easy, almost impossible to knock over a five-gallon bucket no. and spill it. The tension is building, and the detectives are hoping that Carl will crack soon. You were 600 feet away from the house, yet your wife's in a boarded-up little room, and you hear her calling your name from no, 600 it, it feet away. it wasn't calling. It was screaming. Screaming your name. And yet, you're able to get blown off the porch... Open your eyes, your son's uninjured, you're able to grab your uninjured son out with this explosion just right. took place. Without a mark on him, take him out of the mm -hmm. house, run around, miraculously save your two daughters, and let your and wife, they, they and which, let your wife perish in this fire. I didn't with, with no attempt to rip that board off, that plywood board off that house, and get into that bathroom and help. I went around, by that time, the fire was all the way around. What am I going to do? No. 
That fire was all the way around, and you don't take a chance to look into that window and see your wife. There's no flames in that bathroom. Until, right until you're there. Your sister-in-law tells me that when they fly out there, they fly out to California to be there with you, that you want to go show them redwood trees and go dance and go dance on a redwood tree and go around. It lets nothing happen. No. The detective's tone is drastically different than it was before. He becomes significantly more animated, talking louder and pointing out all of the holes in Carl's story. I had no... So these were just a lot of coincidences that you take a life and just policy out on your wife a matter of three weeks, two weeks, one week before the fire. Just a coincidence that she goes in the bathtub and the fire starts up right outside in the middle of the floor of that door in a hallway. That's where fires always start. All she, all she had... Every time we've done fires, Jack, always start in the hallway with no, with no source of the fire around. But that's, but that's a coincidence. Just total coincidence. You go out and you collect $200,000, $210,000, $215,000. You come back here, you buy your farm... No, I didn't buy a farm. Ultimately, you did. Did you not ultimately buy a farm? You bought a house, and then you ultimately bought your parents' farm. Right, and I, right? Paid, I paid my dad for it. You sure did. But ultimately, How money I worked for. Levi, this one son of yours, this black sheep son, the one son that you don't get along with. No, you can't say that. Are you great friends with him? At the end, very much so. So Levi, it just total coincidence, takes out a seven hundred thousand dollars insurance policy and names for his father that he doesn't get along with. He's a sole beneficiary. No. And you happen to pay the policy. And his death takes place one day before he has to have his physical, which you be know, both know he's not going to pass because of the situation he has with his choking and his throat. You're, you're very familiar with his medical history. So he comes yeah, over your house, you entice him over your house. I don't just entice him, him over the house. To pay him money. You're not going to pay him money? Yeah, but I'm not enticing him. It's just what he always done. Levi, come on over. I got fifty dollars for you. Can you come? You're broke, and I got money for you. No, he wasn't broke. He was working at Guardian at the time. I didn't know anything about any of his business, money wise. I don't know what they paid. So he was he was flush with money. No, he had. I mean, when you. So now he comes over to your house with a seven hundred thousand dollars life insurance policy. One day from his physical, you go out there. I don't know when his physical was. I don't know when it was. You go out there. He gets under this truck. That your son, the, the one you're supposed to love and care for. This yeah. is your blood, your flesh and blood. And you jack it up on the on the chintziest, lousiest jacking system going that we both know of being on fire. And they're with no blocks, powerful. no nothing to support in case it falls over. Just uh, it's only my son going underneath there. And if this truck falls on him, it'll crush him and kill him. But miraculously, the truck falls over on him while you're there. And you no, say, I wasn't in there when it happened. Well, you see, you might say that, but you, we both know you were in there. Right. And you then just say, well, the truck's crush them. Oh, I don't want to take advantage of it, but I sure am happy that maybe I leaned up against it and it fell over on them. But I said, I took advantage of the situation once it happened. And then I go back in the house. I don't mention anybody. I don't, I don't call for help. I didn't did you call 911 for help? I didn't Did know. you call for help? No. And so he needed help. And you're his biological father and you don't give him help? What kind of father are you? Piece of yeah, exactly. By confronting him with all of the discrepancies at once, he hopes Carl will feel defeated and lose resolve in both his story and himself. You don't give him help. You let him be crushed under there. You go back and go, okay, honey, let's go to your uncle's funeral down in Penny Ann. And you get in that car and you drive. And you know, you're unemotional. Driving along four and a half hours into it. You drive down. You drive back and you say, showtime. I need to put on a show to make it so nobody knows what happened. And you go out to that garage where the radio's been cranked up so when he, when you, the truck crushed him, he could scream and yell and nobody could hear his screams. Country music, which he didn't listen to, you know he didn't like, and it's screaming, it's blaring. It's blaring loud so he can't be heard. And you come back and you say, again, it's showtime for Carl to put on my show. My miraculously, I'm a liar show. And you go run back to the house and go, oh my God, Cindy, hurry, call 911. The truck fell over on Carl. Well, you've known that for four and a half hours, and you want them to come out to your lifeless son's cold, dead body. Carl hangs his head, indicating that he's shutting out what the detective is saying, or possibly that he's feeling defeated. In an interview, Cindy later revealed that when Carl found Levi, she thought that he acted overly distraught because he threw himself up against the wall. Showtime. Within one month, I'm there, I'm adamant. I get my $700,000 policy. I don't take my $700,000 spent on the grandkids. 
which my son intended for, no. I say, hey, I'm broke. No. My my insurance, my policy, my retirement plan went from over hundred thousand no, no, dollars no, no, down to thirty thousand. No, no, no. I was, am flush this money was, again. No, this was in the wife's name too. Once again, he places blame on anyone but himself. He continually blames Cindy for how the insurance money was spent. Carl refuses to take responsibility for anything, a classic sign of narcissism. Being exploitative and taking advantage of others for their own gain is another sign of a narcissist. Killing a family member for insurance money would definitely be considered exploitative. The grandkids, all the you think these girls got to be raised from the time they're two and four years old, and they get nothing. But, but Carl says, Alan, I like, can take care of myself. Uh, Le oh, I couldn't take care of it. Levi did not want Cassie to know about it or to get a penny from it. Levi did. And he didn't want the. He wanted the grandkids to grow up in squalor, didn't he? He wanted them to grow up in a shit house and a shit crap trailer, living like paupers when their dad had seven hundred and fifteen thousand dollars in life insurance. So Carl got to build up his you little need to talk about, no. You need no, to talk because you, you, you squandered away you like you, to you had your whole too. life. You doesn't mean that you, you didn't take it for yourself. You took the money for yourself and put little to nothing in the girl's name. And ultimately, that money was in the girl's name. You had total disregard for that, too, because you had no problem taking that money out of it and oh. putting it right back in your pocket. Oh, I had a problem with it. Oh, really? Where is it? It's interesting to note that during the entire diatribe, the detective gives... Carl remains silent until he starts discussing money, and then Carl chimes in and starts arguing back. You had such a problem. Is it in the girl's name? the wife. Oh, she took it out? And you didn't take anything? You didn't benefit from it? Oh, we both did. We both did. You did benefit. You benefited 700000 no. in a loss of your she son. She still got her hundred and some. When did the act stop, Carl, and the truth comes out? When? Is there ever truth with you? Yes. When? It, 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 it's, it hasn't been seen in the 20-some years we've researched you. There is no truth. Do you yes. want to talk about the truth? You got to start thinking about some damage control, Carl. Carl's own words are finally coming back to haunt him. I did not kill him. What killed him? The truck. How did the truck kill him? It landed on him. And I had nothing to do with the truck landing on him. Now, stop and think a minute. Do you think that anybody's going to believe no. that you confessed to Cindy because you were playing a game with her and you left your son laying there dead because you were in shock for four and a half hours? Yeah. Do you think people are going to believe that? I No. No, they're not. So you don't you think you ought to do a damage I, control here and start telling what really happened? That's what happened. It's not what well, happened. It did. It did. It did not happen that way. There's no way. It did. I've been around a long time, Carl. Nobody does that. Can All I right? See, do you mind if I stand back up again? Oh, it's likely that Carl is trying again to escape the intense questioning when he asks to stand up. The detective appears annoyed and angry, and he storms out of the room, intentionally leaving Carl alone with his friend, the lieutenant. The lieutenant then pretends to take Carl's lying personally. Jesus Christ, Carl. Well, I can't tell you something that's not true, sir. Carl's language has shifted somewhat, and he's now calling the detective sir, this is likely because the dynamic between Carl and the detectives changed once they increased the intensity of the questioning. Addressing the detectives in a formal manner may be an attempt by Carl to show them he's being cooperative, respectful, and that he is trustworthy. You know, I'll go out on a limb for you to try and show that maybe there's some extenuating circumstances here, and, 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 and you're going to throw this cock and bull story? Come on. No one's going to believe that, Carl. All right, Carl, I really wish you'd be... Last chance, buddy. After this, then things go as they go. The lieutenant gives Carl an ultimatum. This is his last chance to confess. It's now or never. Of course, the police will never deny a suspect the ability to confess, but this statement is an attempt to add urgency in the suspect's mind. I can't tell you what didn't happen, sir, and I mean it. I don't want you to. But what you told me so far doesn't make any sense at all. And you know it doesn't. Carl has his head in his hands and is clearly showing signs of stress. He's claiming that it's his need for medication, which is possible, but it's more likely that he feels the walls closing in on him and his freedom. 
He's now beginning to digest this. Carl's body language at this point is closed off. He's facing away from the detective and only makes limited eye contact, suggesting that he is disengaged from the conversation or possibly feeling defeated. Compared to the beginning of the interrogation, he's much more quiet. What game were you playing? And what if... What, 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 okay, what, 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 what if I... Carl. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, tell me the f***ing truth, Carl. I can't tell you something I didn't do. You know, I'll walk down the road with you. I, I will. I'll walk down the road. I'll stand by you on this, if you are honest about it. Because everybody else that's working this case is pretty much giving up on it. Yeah, but look what happens to me. I'm going to go to the jail. When Carl states he's going to jail, he may be fishing for information about whether the detectives have enough evidence to convict him. I don't know what's going to happen to you yet. For some, I didn't do. You know, for some, I didn't do. I let him down. I walked away. And I lived with that for four years. You know, you guys somehow, you know, pulled that out of me. And in a way, it's been a relief. Good. It should be relief. I never heard him. I couldn't. You did. It's all right. As the lieutenant sees Carl is breaking down, he now touches him to encourage him to confess. Unsurprisingly, Carl first wants to know how confessing will help him. I'll stand up for you. What are you going to do for me? I'm going to stand up and say this wasn't premeditated, cold-blooded murder, that it was just something that happened. Shit happens sometimes, Carl. That's what I'll do for you. In five seconds, Carl will seal his fate deeper than any moment before in this entire interrogation. Next. I opened the truck door. Okay. When they did the <laughs> Finally, Carl divulges that it was an accident and breaks down crying. The lieutenant pats him on the back, supporting <laughs> Carl for this admission, but then quickly presses him for more. However, even if Carl doesn't fully confess, the officers have more than enough evidence to show his actions were planned and intentional. <laughs> and if I hit the box underneath it, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> Carl, what was an accident? Then why'd you try and hide it? <laughs> You're very close, Carl. Come on. I didn't do it. <laughs> I think part of you did. May not all of no you. No way. I didn't. There was nothing. <laughs> Man, you can do it. It's an accident. I put up the f***ing door and stepped in. <laughs> I got a f***ing cramp on my back. Carl again uses no. his ailments to distract from the confession. No. I started getting muscles bad. It was bad. Okay, well, I got somebody working on it. I got somebody working on getting that for you. Let's finish. We're almost done. It's impossible to believe Carl's claim that he accidentally killed his son by stepping inside the truck. Even someone who isn't knowledgeable about jacks would not do such a dangerous thing. And Carl has been working on cars since he was a kid. So you open the car door? I opened the truck door because I had to get inside to move the linkage for the truck. And when I did, it tipped and it just fell over. When Carl sees that the detective is not accepting the accident version of events, he asks to stand up again, likely to try to escape the interrogation. I had nothing to do with any of the other things. I don't give a shit how bad it looks. Carl makes sure to add he isn't culpable for the other stuff. As once again, he's focused on himself and self-preservation, even while admitting to killing his son. The detective returns, and the lieutenant reveals that Carl has confessed. 
It's likely that the detective was watching the confession and strategically re-entered the room. He pulls a chair up directly in front of Carl and leans into him to invade his personal space. The detective is, again, being friendly to Carl, but this will not remain the case. But did you know he died of suffocation because his lung was collapsed? And if the truck was lifted off him, he would have been able to breathe. I don't know what I was thinking. But if you just jacked it back up, you I know how to use that railroad jack. Oh, so yeah, it I know. fell. I know. So the truck fell on, on your son, and instead of jacking it back up, you ran. I was scared as sh. I don't know why. I don't know just why. Just a mental thing. It just went I just sh- went. It didn't register. It just blanked. So I just got the hell out of there like a kid that threw a window through a glass or something and didn't want to get caught. Oddly, when telling detectives the new version of the accident that caused Levi's death, Carl states that he was like a kid who didn't want to get caught. If Carl's story is true, it would certainly make sense to Carl to feel some guilt about inadvertently causing his son's death. However, it would be very strange to describe that he didn't want to get caught if it truly was unintentional. Their lungs can't expand and he can't breathe. So your son was still very much alive and you could have saved him. And you could have brought him to life, but you ran and let him die? The detective now begins to play bad cop to the lieutenant's good cop and confronts Carl with the fact that after the truck fell, he left him there to die instead of helping him to dispel his story that it was an accident. What, why? Because of the insurance policy? No, no, no. It just... Because... I'm scared. I don't know. I it don't, had nothing to do with insurance policy. Nothing. It, I never even thought of it at that time. I just thought, oh, f- Do you think that I believe that? I don't care what anybody believes. I really don't anymore. Do you think anybody in this world is going to Probably be not. I didn't kill him. You did kill him. You did yeah, kill I him. Did. Intentionally. No. Accidentally. Yeah, it was an accident. Just when I fell over on him, instead of going to his aid, his rescue of, of your son, you said, nah, it wasn't. He said, he's going to die if I don't help him, so I'm not going to help him. What did you say? I don't want him to live? Nothing. It just, I just, nothing. Didn't you, didn't you, you were in the military, didn't you tell the investigator earlier that you made me kill people, save lives? But you go blank. You, I went blank. It's my kid. It's just, no, nobody goes blank in that regard. See, this guy here, he believes you. Me? I, I, I'm, not the, I'm not the guy that's believing your story. The detective claims that the lieutenant believes Carl's story despite the fact that he doesn't, in order to play up the good cop, bad cop routine they've started. Carl turns his body away from the bad cop and toward the good cop, trying to decrease his feelings of discomfort. No, I don't know what to tell you anymore. I think for once, once in your life, I don't know if you've done it in 50 years, but I think it's about time you sit around and you told somebody the truth. Carl, you killed him, and you pushed that truck over him, and knowing that you could have saved him, Knowing that you could have helped him, you never wanted to help him. You never wanted to save him and get that truck off him. No. Because seven hundred thousand dollars plus was waiting for you. Who gives a shit about the money? Well, you very much gave a about the money. What does? In fact, you told me how excited you were about this big merit horse you had. It was going to make you millions of dollars. Make you millions of dollars. That was. That was. You're a money-driven individual, Carl. Period. Yeah. Seven hundred thousand dollars is what you had gained from his debt. $200,000 is what you had gained from your wife's death in California. The detective confronts Carl with the changing stories he's told in the hopes that he will finally tell the real story, as he's already been proven to be a liar. We're talking about the situations of all these fires, of all these deaths, uh, of all these alleged coincidences that happen to be fully insured, each one of them, to the max. Because, I don't know what you call the max. I, I have no insurance on my kids. I don't know why you would have insurance of $700,000 on your side. I'm not going to call you a liar. I'm going to tell you that you're as untruthful as any person I've ever met and attempt to be more manipulative and to do what you did to your son and try to tell us three different versions of it without still telling us the truth shows me who you really are. The detective completely dresses Carl down. He then walks out, leaving the lieutenant there to play the good cop and see if Carl leans on him for comfort. This is all part of the good cop, bad cop technique. Carl, I I think that Uh, that, I think most of of them are gonna feel like he does. I know, I I, what am I gonna say? I think you ought to just take the next, take the last step, you're almost there. Would you mind, can I get more water or even just fill up a cup or something? I don't need 
Carl requests water, once again conveniently distracting from the issue at hand. I'm tired of you, Carl. Okay. Yeah, I don't want him to die. No, I'm not telling you straight. I don't mean that to be an insult. The reason I'm saying that is because you walked away from him and you left him there with a the truck on top of him. Mm-hmm. Some part of you had to, had to be okay with that. I don't know why I would have been. This is a sworn statement. You have to tell the truth on this. Okay. All right. Um, why don't you write your account of what happened that day? The lieutenant is now completing the last step of the read technique by having Carl reduce his confession to writing on an affirmation. This makes it more difficult to retract a confession or say your words were misunderstood when they are written down by the suspect himself, knowing it is a sworn statement. There's something you want, you think you should apologize for. This is not a bad place to do it. If you want to write a, an apology to Levi after your statement happened. I mean, are you sorry what happened, Carl? I don't know. I, I mean, I, 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 yeah. how do you walk away? I mean, how do you... That's the hard part. Because that's the hang-up here. I know, and I, I understand that. And it's like... Because the, the, the brutal and, truth... And this, this the is, brutal truth is, you did kill him. Whether, whatever your intent was, I, 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 the action you took caused the truck to fall on him. The action I... Yeah, and and then the inaction of leaving them there... Right. Okay, so... Contributed, or whatever. You know, yeah. I wonder, and I've often wondered, did the drugs play a role? By now, Carl likely has a good idea about how much evidence is against him. So he's trying to more concretely build a defense that he doesn't remember his actions because of the drugs he was on. He's been hinting at this defense throughout the interrogation. It's not a believable defense, as this was planned for weeks. He recalled many details about other things in his life at that time with no problem whatsoever. Well, you know how people that are on drugs, they kill people. That are, yeah. you know, and it's like, and they don't remember it. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not saying it's like that. I'm just saying. But it could be. <sighs> After Carl is alone, he puts his head in his hand, which could suggest that he's feeling defeated and or fatigued. He then shifts to an even more downtrodden position, leaning onto his knee with his head down. Day has drifted into night, and at this point, he has been in the interrogation room for over nine hours. So feeling worn out would be expected. He's likely thinking, and possibly feeling anxious, about what is going to happen next. They have the lieutenant effectuate the arrest, as he's the one who's been playing good cop, and Carl will be more cooperative with him. Well, come with me. You're under arrest. I think you knew that was coming. Of course, as you may have speculated, Carl's arrest was far from how it all ended. After Carl was arrested, Cindy realized that the pelvic pain she'd been experiencing when around him abruptly stopped. She now wonders if Carl had possibly been trying to poison her with arsenic. Though this is just speculation, Cindy was likely lucky to escape with her life, especially given the fate of Carl's first wife, Chris. The findings that were unearthed during the extensive investigation into Levi's death raised many new questions, and they were the kind that couldn't go unanswered. Not this time around. In the months that followed his arrest, Carl continued to insist that he was not to blame for Levi's death. Then, in a strange turn of events, on the very day his trial was set to begin, Carl pleaded guilty to murder in the second degree on November 6, 2013. The following month, he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. His self-described bad luck took a turn for the absolute worst several years after he pleaded guilty to causing Levi's death. 